right now, I'd like to introduce some other elected officials that are in the room. We have Representative Amy Peruso. Um, she's well over there. In, and we have Speaker Emeritus Calvin Say, who is over there. Okay. Our next presenter is Dr. Paul Brubaker. He is the principal of TZ Economics, a Hawaii economics consultancy. His background in research on, a Hawaii economic, in, on the Hawaii economy and financial risk analytics stems from a 25-year affiliation, 25 affiliation with the Bank of Hawaii, concluding as its chief economist. He is a graduate of Stanford University, did graduate work at the University of Wisconsin, and received a PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii. He has lectured extensively in international monetary and financial economics. He is a member of the American Economic Association, the American Finance Association, and the National Association of Business Economics, which he holds a certified business economic, economist designation. Today, he'll be presenting on why we need more housing. Please welcome Dr. Paul Brubaker. Thank you, Adrian. I'm gonna give my answers to Dean's questions because I have to go catch an airplane um, sometime. So, last question, last question. Um, so, I call, I distinguish between affordable, the adjective housing, which has a small a, and capital A, affordable housing, which is branding, it's a fake thing. And so the question was actually about low-income housing. Low-income housing needs to be subsidized, and if the state doesn't have the political will to do that, then it won't be. So that's the answer to that question. Climate change, build Malka. What was the other one? The Wahini over here? Seniors, if they're low income, that's low income housing. If they're rich buggers, I don't care. And then the first question, oh, bro, you're, bro, you're on the Land Use Commission. Bro, entitlement is a call option on the future value of a house struck at today's construction cost. Okay, so I'll give you an analogy. If you look at the volume of bacon, pork bellies, trading in the commodity markets in the Chicago Board of Trade or Mercantile Exchange, it's 10, I'm sorry, the options on pork belly futures, okay, these are just derivatives. The open interest in options on pork belly futures, last time I checked, which was 30 years ago, was about 10 times the amount of bacon that's actually produced in America, right? So if you're urbanizing agricultural land, right, you're, you're creating urban land designation, that's entitlement, that's an option. Most options expire without being exercised. So if you think, because you're on the Land Use Commission, that 5,000 acres is adequate and it's not being utilized, then the assumption is incorrect. You need way more optionality because not all of it's going to be. Even when people get the entitlement, they can't, you know, get the project to pencil out. Or the state says you got to build an overpass to get to your freaking development. So then it'll never be built, right? What's the one? Ten thousand. Wyapa Ridge, right? Ten thousand units authorized. I don't know how many thousand acres. And here's the catch: you got to build a bridge. Oh, bro, we're screwed. How come you don't build the bridge? Well, we don't do that anymore. We don't build highways anymore. We get you guys to build the highways. So there's, so those are my answers to Dean's question. So here's, um, so I'm talking about affordable, the adjective housing, okay? And you can get a copy of the PDF from Adrian, who I'm envious of because he just got back from Vienna, you bum. And you want to see what public housing looks like, go to Vienna and go take the, which Strassenbahn is it? Anyway, it goes by Karl Marxhoff, which is, there's three Strassenbahn stops, the length of Karl Marxhoff, which is up in Heiligenstadt, which was built in the 1920s, when the government there built 65,000 public housing units. You know, I'm gonna talk about 65,000 units without computers, okay? So it can be done if the political will is there. But I'm talking about affordable, the adjective housing. And if you look at the append, you get a copy of the PDF from Adrian, or the, the senator's office, I presume, will post this stuff. 
and then you can go, go look at the appendix and, and, and we can if we have time. Okay, so which one do I press? How does this work? What am I doing? Oh, there. No? What, what did you press? Oh, the, okay. So, so this is the problem of not having the slideshow in front of you. So I don't usually read my bullet points, so there you go. Um, right? Restricting home building is essentially protectionism. Okay? It protects the political interests of the existing homeowners. I live in Kailua. I'm all in favor of nobody ever building another house in Kailua because that adds value to my property. So shut up and get out of here. Go live in Eva. Okay? And there are a variety of ways we do this. We use exclusionary zoning, right? And so whenever you hear the code phrase, it, it, we, we need to preserve the character of our neighborhood. You hear that lately, right? People thought, oh, big monster home. Oh, oh, we don't want Jews living in our neighborhood. Remember that language? We need to preserve the character. We don't want any ties living in our neighborhood. That's the language. Watch out for the language. Um, production quotas, we, they're branded as inclusionary zoning to distinguish it from exclusionary zoning, but it's just branded, branding. They're just quotas. You need to build this much in order to do that. You need to build this in order to do that. Okay, that's like Trump tariff policy. Fees and other exemptions, also known as bribes. And then a, right? You want this, you pay me that. Um, and then a tedious permitting process that I won't get into, but um, okay. I mean, it's taking so long for people to get permits that contractors are laying off their workers right now. And even worse than that, the workaround is, we'll let you start building without the permit. Right, true story. So I'm a recovering commercial bank economist. I won't say which bank. And one day, the government affairs guy's office was across the hall from my office. And one day, the bucket, he's running around all, oh, right, I gotta do all this stuff. I'm like, what's going on? Oh, the new, um, the kind, uh, what's above Eva? Uh, Ka Ka Kunia, the new Ka Kunia branch going open. When? Oh, next Monday. And this is like Thursday, yeah? Oh, Kunia branch going open on Thursday. New branch. Who builds a new bank branch, right? Have you heard of internet? Who builds, who, right? Right? Okay. So what's the problem? Well, the fire, the fireman guys, the fire inspector guys came by, and they got to do the inspection, right? And they get, you get a fire hose, okay, something like that. Except there's no building permit. And I'm like, what do you mean there's no building permit? The branch is finished. The inspector's coming to certify the fire safety, right? Yeah, no, bro. We built it without, they told us, go ahead and build it. We give you comfort letter, right? Tell us a comfort letter. Oh, the letter that says, go ahead and build it. So, bro, the bugger running around, he had 48 hours, because you know at 4.15, everybody at the city going home on Friday, right? He had, he's running around to get a permit for a bank branch that's already finished because the fire inspectors won't certify. And the grand opening is like the next week. True story. That kind of stuff happens all the time. So, okay, blah, 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 blah. Here are the data. These are the numbers of housing units authorized by building permit on Oahu for about the last century. And you see that big drop? That's what Dean was talking about. He goes, something happened in the 1970s. Yeah, we all became hippies, right? We all joined the Sierra Club, and we said, ooh, sustainability, or whatever, right? The rules changed. The Land Use Commission used to pre-authorize in 5,000-acre increments agricultural land to be urbanized. They go, how much land do we need? 5,000 acres. Okay, ready? Go. And then for five years, people would go, and then they would have another meeting. How much land do you need? Hey, another 5,000 acres, bro. Hey, go. The year I graduated from Kailua High School in 1973, 13,000 housing units were authorized by building permit on this island with slide rules. Right? The computer was Pong. <laughs> right? And it's so good, this decade, only World War was worse with computers. So we did that. And the line you see there with the two standard error bandwidth, that's actually a little model I built because my friend looked at the data and he goes, no, bro, that's the change in population growth, right? So the joke is, um, this is a math problem. So, okay, I see some kids who took math recently. So, okay, math problem. What's 
2018 minus 40. It's a multiple choice question. A, Roe v. Wade. B, oral contraception. C, increasing female labor force participation. And D, all of the above, right? Okay, yeah, the birth rate went down. I get that. You don't need to build as many units if you're not popping out as many babies. That happened. We all did that, okay? So I take that into account. And even taking into account the population the data, that drop is, uh, is this actually dummied out as to some kind of change and radical change in the regulatory environment. That was the beginning, the change in the Land Use Commission's, they went to contested case hearings in 1976. The, what we now call the HCDA was created, and then the HHHHHHFDC, and then all the acronyms came, right? Inclusionary zoning came in the 1980s, and all the stuff we've been loading on top. And back in the day, when I was a kid, you could punch six tunnels and build 12 lanes of multi-lane divided highway to the windward side, and you will never be able to do that to Waianae in my life because the politics have changed and the government doesn't do that, right? We all drive pickup trucks and SUV because driving on Oahu is an off-road experience. Okay. I'm kidding. So don't tell me about population, right? We did that. And we get a copy of the PDF and you can see all the footnotes and now the thing not working anymore. Do I have to? Oh yes, this one, sorry. Same data. This is the incremental capital uh, ratio, so it's the number of new housing units authorized by building permit on Oahu divided by the existing housing stock. It's the proportion of the existing housing stock represented by new housing units. We used to build, from 1945 to 1975, we used to build 4.5% of the existing housing stock each year on Oahu. Today, it's less than 1%. I'm pretty sure the number should be greater than 1%. We can do that math in a second. Here's another uh, depiction of what's going on. The lower series are the actual units authorized on Oahu. The upper series, existing home sales. Which one is constrained? Is there a government agency that tells you whether you can or can't buy a house? Oh, hell no. You want to buy a house? Go buy a house. Is there a government agency that tells you whether you can or can't build a house? Oh, hell yeah. Choke agencies. Right? And you can see the separation. Something happened. And you can really see it in, see in the 80s. When the 80s thing came, every, the upper series is basically demand, and the lower series is basically supply. And when demand outstrips supply, prices have to rise to clear the market, and you're done. right? So inhibiting the supply response is what creates the problem. Demand is unconstrained. Supply is um, constrained. OK, so here are all the data for Oahu and the neighbor islands, right? So your brain on drugs, yeah? So you see any patterns? What patterns do you see? Here's what I see. Looks like it's going downhill. Can you see that? From the upper left to the lower right. Looks like there's kind of a cycle. Look at the neighbor islands, the dark dots. You see the cycle, see the roller coaster? Ooh, about a roller coaster, roller coaster, right? Okay, so let's break this down. Here's the Oahu data. There's that downward trend from, I know I only have a half century of data, and you can see we've moved up to the upper bandwidth, and what we really want, it turns out, actually, this is a pretty good model, but this one's actually better. So here, magic. This is economics hula, right? So the trick is to bend this further upward, or just have the kids live at home with you. Neighbor islands? They're going through their own thing. So everybody's kind of pushed to the upper bound of what the existing bandwidth, I mean, what the existing data would tell you is the bandwidth. And what we're talking about is trying to get that either bent upward, the path bent upward, or making sure we stay at the upper end of that trajectory for Oahu or the neighbor islands. Okay, Th we're not making it building at these volumes. So we need more. Um, structural patterns. So single family on the top, multifamily on the bottom. What do you see? The number of multifamily units authorized by building permit today is the same as single family. There's a change in the structure of the urban environment. We used to all live out in the suburbs. 
with our little cars and our little pickup truck, right? And now the space-time continuum is such that the commute is so hellish from some places, it's not worth living out there. It's worth sucking it up and buying a condo close to town or close to your job, right? So that's, the, that's a change in the pattern of the urban environment over the last half century or so, well, only, only 30 years here. And I'm pretty sure it's here to stay, right? We're, 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 the building is coming back into the city. Thank you, Land Use Commission. I'm not sure it matters anymore. You go talk to Hopili, and they can't sell the units, they can't sell as many units as they thought they could. That's really interesting. You go talk to Castle and Cook, they've been waiting 20 years to get permission to build. 20 years, bro. Right? And they still haven't started. So maybe they'll start. And it's like, how hard was this? It's across the street from Costco, yo. OK, another structural change. The composition of households has changed over the last half century. Right? Back in the day when I was at Mount Willie Elementary School, families that were households comprising married persons with children were almost 60% of households. Today, 20%. When I was at Mount Willie, actually, when I was at I, um, Wailupi Valley Elementary School, which, bro, was in the country. There wasn't even a supermarket in Kaimuki. I don't know, there isn't even a supermarket in Kaimuki today. You, from Ainahaina, you had to go all the way to everybody's supermarket, which is across from Macaulay Shopping Center, right? Now it's a self-storage. But in those days, it was everybody's supermarket. And you drive over Kaimuki and all the way down to Kapuhulu, and then you get supermarket, right? The, the number of persons living alone, when I was a kid, 12% of the population today double as a share of the population. Right? Dude, you got divorced. You need two houses. Right? That's what happened. Female labor force particip participation went from 40% of the workforce to 70% of the workforce. Hey, Tita like her own condo, bro. You know what I mean? She get job. She's your boss. So the pattern of change, the demographic, pa demographic pattern of change over the last half century says, you need more houses, even if there were the same number of people, right? But we haven't been building them, right? It's been going down, not up. So I encourage you to actually read the housing economics literature. I sat in, a, in an Orwellian hearing. Well, so the ones I get paid to sit in are all Orwellian. But I sat in one the other day that was just bizarre when a you know, the prominent planner, famous planner who I deeply respect, for his contributions to society. He actually, somebody asked him about, I'm pretty sure I was the only economist in the room, and somebody asked him about blah, 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 something. And he, I, I, all I remember is what he said. He actually said, well, you know, planners have to take an economics course in college. I was like, well, that about covers it. <laughs> okay, it's all out there. It's all on internet, you guys. Ed Glazer, read anything Ed Glazer has written at the Harvard Center for Housing Studies. Here's a clue. He runs the Harvard Center for Housing Studies. Okay. <laughs> Inclusionary zoning has not worked. Come on. So you're taking time for my Q&A period. Right, there's the UH study, inclusionary zoning, notorious policy fail. It produces less housing, it produces less affordable housing. That's their conclusion. The debate about affordable, the adjective housing, should be broadened to include zoning, right? You got all this wacky stuff. Oh, so climate change question, right? My answer, build Malka. What you mean? I'm talking about the King Street Baratania corridor. You think about the King Street Baratania. Adrian, on the Ringstrasse in Vienna, how tall are the buildings that were built in the 1860s on the Ringstrasse, right? It's a three-lane road with a Schlossenbahn lane and a bike lane and a pedestrian lane on both sides. Okay, so this is broad with trees in between. They're all like six stories. How big is the average building on Baratania? Two stories except for, you know, there's like one 10-story building from 1968, which was the last time you could actually build that building. So you need to, we need to change the zoning, you guys. 
I'm sorry if the neighborhood's changing, but hey, you know what? You moved there, so it already changed. <laughs> That's zoning reform. And then I love this one, right? Steep slopes and water bodies compound the problem of the supply response, right? Steep slopes and water bodies. Yo, that's Oahu. You cannot build in the ocean. And a hundred years ago, we learned not to build up in the watershed. You know why? Because a hundred years ago, the wells ran dry. We were just driving over the poly this morning, my wife and I. I'm telling her, hey, you know, all these trees were planted a hundred years ago. You, you got to imagine the entire Kolau range denuded right deforestation a century and a half of, or more of deforestation and the the border water supply the the artesian well in front of border water supply where is that that's like right over there or something yeah the, the thing ran dry bro you know what i mean the water comes out of the ground in honolulu right waikiki right so that's what we learned you cannot build malka you cannot build makai you have a narrow coastal corridor because the ocean is rising you got to build in the back you got to build Malka not Makai so dude it's obvious you got to get on with it and by the way put the bike lane on uh, in between Kings what's the street in between Young Street bro Young Street bike lane King Street Bear oh, come on <laughs> when you look at the empirical literature Honolulu is at the bottom end of the list in terms of Price elasticity of supply of new housing response, right? We did that. We meant to do that, right? We, us buggers in Fly Lua, yeah, we meant to do that. If you look at the extent of the, of the uh, restric restrictive character of the regulatory environment, Hawaii tops the list more than two standard deviations away from the national norm, right? Bragging rights bra, we're the worst, awesome. In terms of urban house building cost, but it's more expensive to build in Honolulu than in like everywhere, than in New York City. The hell, okay? And this is fascinating. The city had this study done. And uh, so let's take away the production quotas, right? Take a bit away the so called affordable housing, capital A quota. Take away the reserve housing quota. Take that out and leave everything else. What's the cheapest building? What building has the lowest unit construction cost? The biggest building you can build in the front of the house, right? On the right there, a 40-story building in Ala Moana is cheaper to build than a third per unit than a 13-story building by Costco uh, Evile down there. Why? Economies of scale. You just replicate the floor. Once you get a product, they pour a floor a week. Okay, so okay, so there's the literature, and what do people actually read in Hawaii? Are you serious? <laughs> okay, these guys have to sell newspapers in a world where nobody reads newspapers, so they have to scare the crap out of you. So you might actually buy. Right? You're walking down the street and you're like, "Holy crap! I gotta buy that newspaper." What? Condo mania. What was that? Brubaker at the bottom. What's that I said? Right? Okay. I get that. Right? That's the front page. Price is going through the roof. Okay. Wait a minute. Oh, here's the one I love. Too many Pake Bagas buying condos in Kakaako. Like all five Chinese brothers. It's 0.2% of the condos between Salt Lake and Hawaii. Or, what is that? between Central, Salt Lake and Hawaii Kai, bro, that's pretty much the, the urban core, right? 0.2% purchased by Chinese nationals, nationals from 2008 to What are we, have you seen the movie Crazy Rich Asians? Okay, I'm just saying, it's mostly locals, bro. At the front of the house, I'm told 70% local. One block back on Oahe Street or Queen Street, 80% local. You know what I mean? How many high rises are being built on Baratania? Bro, I can't afford to live at the front of the house, right? We all gonna be living on King Street. How many condos being built on King Street on the number two bus line? Zero. What, what is up with that? Okay, and here's another thing. It's not, we're not talking, we're the, okay, there's no affordable 
housing crisis in Honolulu. Here's the measure of affordability. Do your own math. It's so bad, it's about as good as it's ever been. You take median home prices, median four-person family income, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage rate, put it in a blender, and what do you get? It doesn't get much better than this. The 20 teens was as good as it's ever gonna be. I'm looking at the young people in the audience. But you missed it. That's okay, you get four more chances in your life, right? Except the second one you get divorced, so that doesn't count. So then the third one maybe, you gotta watch out because one of those you gotta pay for your kids to go to college, so you're gonna miss that one. But there's the cycle. Yes, it's been bad. And those thresholds, by the way, are the uh, Fannie Mae and the um, somebody else guideline, FHFA guideline. Okay, the debt to income ratio, mortgage debt to income ratio. So we're well within the affordability zone and it's only once before, I only have data for 40 years, the only time it was better was in the late 1990s when you may remember how home prices fell 20%. So yeah, that'll do it. And here are the actual data. Dean referred to them a second ago. These are median Oahu single family home prices, the conventional metric that people use. It used to be a roller coaster and now it's an escalator. You need to get on the escalator of life. Okay, you could wait till the next bottom of the roller coaster, but I don't see that happening. We are not in a bubblicious market. There are other markets in the country that are bubblicious, not this one, not this decade. I don't see that happening in the 2020s either. So you just got to get on the escalator. You got to suck it up, call up Tutu, make family hooey, get the down payment however you can, and get in there. And, and here's something, advice I got in 80, 1987, you see at the bottom of that, right before the acceleration, Somebody told me, a famous urban economist told me, bro, you just gotta suck it up, buy the crappiest condo as far from town as possible, and then build some equity, and then you can move back in. And I should have done it, you know? Instead, I had to do some wacky family deal where Tutu said, okay, all you boys, make hui, family hui. You guys all gotta buy the house, and you gotta all move inside the house together, you and all your kids, and your wives, and yeah, bro. Okay, and then, then later on, you buy each other out. That's how that works. But that's how most people, right? That's how most families do it. That's how Dean's going to do it. He goes, we're so sick of his kids living at home. Hey, just buy the house from me. I go buy a condo and, you know, go side seat in. <laughs> if you adjust for inflation, now, by the way, the slope, you can see the curvature, right? We used to get 5% appreciation in, on the trend back in the day with high inflation. Now we have low inflation. That's not going away. We live in a 2% inflation environment. So you take today's three or three and a half percent appreciation rate, maybe four, but it's slowing down, and you subtract 2% inflation, you should get about a 2% real rate of return. And you adjust, so these are median prices from the Board of Realtors. Go get the FHFA data set that has all the mortgage data in it. These are valuations. You can see the cycles in the past. We've converged to the long run trend, which is about two and a half percent real appreciation, right? Your total return is price appreciation, two and a half percent, plus the dividend. What's the dividend? You get to live in the house, okay? It's worth paying 5% for a 30-year mortgage to get the package, I'm just saying. And neighbor islands, which were more bubblicious in the last cycle, right? They have their own problems. These guys, okay, big island is so big, all the other islands can fit inside with land left over. And even those guys are all like, oh, bro, we reached our carrying capacity. Shut up. <laughs> you built your house on a live volcano. What? <laughs> and here's the most scary, this, okay. The real value, the inflation adjusted value of the average single family home on Oahu today is the same as it was at the peak of the cycle in 1990. I do not like this curvature. I'm thinking it's time to bust a move, like away from Oahu. I'm just saying, this is really fascinating to me. Okay, so blah, 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 but oh no, this is really important. So now you can go and get Google search data. What time am I done, 8.15? Um, 
you go get Google search data, you go get public record, right? So all, all you kids, you know, big data, deep data, blah, blah, blah. So you're gonna kick my ass in statistics, yeah? So Google search data, and then you have public record mortgage data, what you call mortgage, what do you call it when you file a mortgage? Nothing. Mortgage, anyway. Okay, the mortgages all go in the mortgage-backed security pools, right? And uh, when you book the mortgage, right? And then it's all public record data. And then you go get the conveyance data, right? So you can see where, where did people search, right? Is search, acquisition, move. The housing market, right? This path is, is the path traced out by, by a dynamic equilibrium in which prices are evolving over time when things get too hot, because it's the Japan bubble, right, the J-bub, right, when things get too hot because it's an exogenous source of demand and supply is constrained, then prices have to rise to clear the market. And then you go through, in the late 90s, you, you reverse it out. And then in the subprime bubble, we had the same thing, and, and appreciation, a bubblicious period of appreciation. Okay, now we don't have that, but my point, what was my point? Oh, you can go look. You can look at the actual data now, because we have all this big data, and here's the process, and, and I realized this after reading a couple of these papers. So this is what I told the ACDA last time. It doesn't really matter what you build. Anything you build creates an affordable housing unit. And I only knew this because when my son came home, my son came home, he's working for Tesla, ooh, sorry, right? And so he's living at my house, and he's working at Tesla with his freaking stock options. And I'm like, why are you living at my house? And so eventually he moved out to Macaulay and Young Street, right? And I was like, bro, that, I lived in that apartment. Actually, I did live in his uncle, in his granduncle's apartment one time, which was hilarious, because when I moved in, I was like, wow, this is really familiar. Wait a minute. OK, but right? When he finally moved out, he moved into a three-story cinder block walk-up with the parking underneath and the laundry in a cage. You know what I'm talking about? We all lived in that unit. How did that work out? Well, when Ralph Misick, the chief risk officer of First Wine Bank, when Ralph and Erlinda's daughters grew up and went to college, they're like, finally, we can leave Mililani Malka. Because for 20 years, they drove from Mililani, dropped the kids off at Punahou, went down to Bank of Hawaii, First Hawaiian Bank, whichever, and then went to work, and then went back and picked up the kids and drive home, okay? That sounds like life as a commuting hell to me, but fine. So Ralph and Erlinda, when the kids moved out, they bought a condo right downtown in Capitol Place, and now Ralph, the chief risk officer at First Hawaiian Bank, goes home for lunch. You know what I mean? Not home lunch, he goes home for lunch, okay, and he saves hours every day by not having to drive, who moved into the five bedroom, three and a half bathroom house in Mililani Malka? Another family from Waikele that needed a bigger house because the teenage girls all need their own rooms. Who moved into their house? Another family with younger kids that needed extra bedroom because the kids, who moved into their house in Waikele? A family in, living in a townhouse in Eva that's starting to have babies and then who moved into the townhouse in Eva? The people living in the one bedroom cinder block walk up apartment in Young Street and Macaulay that my son moved into and out of my house. The creation of a high end condo downtown allowed my son to move out of my house and into the same apartment we all lived in when we moved out of our house. Okay? So, yes, I'm all in favor of building affordable housing, but I'm talking about building any housing, okay? Blah, 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 I think that's the end, right? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, and bottom, transfer wealth to the poor. You have a choice. You can give them cash, right? You can give, the economists will say, no, brother, just give them a housing voucher, and then they'll go find a cheap place to live. Why would you build? Okay, what's wrong with this picture? Thou shalt build affordable housing on the most expensive land in Honolulu, at the front of the house in Kaka'ako. So you're gonna get less for your money. Is that what you're saying? 
But if I give them cash, where are they going to live? By the train station in Waipahu, right? Because the apartment more cheap over there. Or you can just build Karl Markshof in Heiligenstadt. Just go build 65,000 units of public housing. And then guess what? All of a sudden, everybody needs a public housing unit. But hey, pick one. I don't care. That's what you do for the low-income guys. For everybody else, one through eight. Okay, get a copy and read it. Here are the numbers. We're building statewide about 3,700 units of the 6,500 units per year that DBED identified as needed in the next decade of which, you know, 2015 to 2025. That's their estimate. We're building about 3,700 of the 6,500 units. So we're about 3,000 units short, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and counting. Plus, I'm just looking at the building permits, their entitlements. Remember the call option on the the call option on the pork belly future analogy, right? Just because you get a permit doesn't just because you see a permit issued doesn't necessarily mean a housing unit is actually building, being built. You need to create more optionality than is actually being exercised if you're ever going to get close to that number. 6,500 building permits is not act. You need 6,500 units. That means you may need 9,000 building permits. Hell, what, just put them on eBay until the price is zero. Then you know you have enough. Because there's three parts of the cost of building a house. The land, the structure, and the entitlement. And the only thing we control is the cost of the entitlement. Make it as close to zero as possible. I used to say this. I've been saying this for 30 years. Make a market for the entitlement. Make a market for carbon emissions. Everybody, so we're still not doing any of it, right? So now we have eBay, and I tell people, right, for 40 years I've been saying, make a market for carbon emissions. Nah, how would we do that? Just make an auction. So now we have eBay. You don't even, you all buy stuff on eBay or Amazon, whatever, right? And still the analogy doesn't, people don't get it. Put, you know you have enough entitlement when the price on eBay is zero. Okay, think about that. Or, plus, there's the units we haven't been building for decades and decades and decades. This 6,500 units, plus the unexercised optionality, plus the tens of thousands of housing units we never built, which is why my boys all live in Denver. Even a job at Tesla, the baga split, okay? So we got to do all that, or we can, you know, we can adopt the attitude of Brooklyn. Forget about it. And there you go. The end. We have time for a few questions, I think. Oh, hey, sorry. Here's my bumper sticker, right? Forget everything you heard. There's the two bumper stickers, the nerd bumper sticker. Density is proximity. Proximity is mobility, right? This is not the 1950s. We're not all going to go live out in the suburbs because back in the day, you could drive out there easy, no traffic, right? But those days are over. On the entire planet, those days are over. So you have to build in the urban core. You have to go for the density. You have to put it in Malka because the ocean is coming inside. And when I say the ocean is coming inside, the ocean is coming underneath the building. And then the Sheraton Waikiki will fall into the ocean, OK? Or if the left is too egg-headed for you, here's my other bumper sticker. Keep the country country, make the city city. Our policy is make the city country. And it's idiotic. The end. We do have five minutes. For, we do have a few minutes for questions other than Dean's questions. Right? The answers to which are you got to build housing for the poor people or not your choice you got to build malka i'm thinking the train got to be malka i'm just saying think about it i wasn't thinking about it 10 years ago now i am you guys alamana boulevard is going to be a dike i'm just telling you that's that's going to happen so you got to build malka and what was the other one Anyway, 
I got my own questions, I'm sure. Or not, I can go catch my plane. Okay, get a copy of the PDF and then, and apologize to Donna and, and, and uh, all, my, all my old buddies who, with whom we've been having these debates for, for like 30 years. And um, there are other perspectives and I, I, I hope you take them to heart. I wish I could be here for more of that discussion and I'm just sorry I can't. So mahalo you guys. <clears throat> You want to come up here? Yeah, are you guys sure you guys don't have any questions for him? You, you may ask this. Here. Hit the lights. Can, okay, after the POW, check this out. When is the next downturn? So this is the first thing is from a commercial, there's a commercial real estate guy I hear I know. The survey of commercial real estate professionals around the country. Where are we in the current cycle? At the beginning, or towards the end? Towards the end, you guys. Okay, I'm just saying, survey says, closer to the end than to the beginning. Now, what you saw in the earlier data, there, currently there is no cycle in valuations. Here, there is in San Francisco, there is in Santa Clara County, in San Jose, right? There's in, there are hot spots around the country. There's a small one in Denver, Boulder, um, but not in Honolulu. And here's an interesting observation. If there's no bubble, in Honolulu, and, and neighbor island valuations are all converging to the long-term trend, then what are we whining about? If you converge to trend, that by definition means that housing is in long-run dynamic equilibrium. And the scary news is, the only reason that would be true if enough people are leaving to make it so. And if you look at the Honolulu data, there are four times since 1875 that the population of Honolulu declined. The first was after the bubonic plague outbreak of 1900, where we burned Chinatown. The second was in the demobilization after World War II. The third was in the post-Cold War, the 90s period where home prices were falling. The third was when people were leaving Oahu in the 1990s uh, because of the peace dividend. And the fourth is 2016 and 2017. More residents left Oahu, net domestic out-migration from Oahu was larger than all other sources of population growth combined. Okay, that's probably not a good thing. I'm thinking part of it is rooted in the military downsizing of this post-Iraq, post-Afghanistan. Okay, a big part of it is military downsizing. And you know that because Force City and Hunt and Actus lend who did all the military housing renovations on base. So like, you know, across the airport viaduct, all that Navy housing over there, right? They have vacant units now. They rebuilt 17,000, they totally tricked out, you know, they pimped out 17,000 housing units, Pearl Harbor, Hickam, up at, you know, on the Grunt Base, everywhere. And now the military population is shrinking um, and so they have to exercise their option. The, the, they, what they have these long-term leases on these houses, right? So they can rent them out to military retirees and now defense contract. They're going into the defense contractor community and saying, hey, bro, you like rent house. So that's really interesting. Do I think it's a trend? No, when I do my own population projections, I get kind of flat for Oahu and I, get, I still get a little more growth for the neighbor islands. But I'm here to tell you, the neighbor islands, no offense you guys, but neighbor islands seem really intent on turning themselves into Molokai, right? They're like totally doing a slam dance on any new industry that shows up. So I'm thinking, hey, you know what? I'm not from the neighbor islands. I'll just shut up. I won't say anymore, right? You guys go do whatever. And yeah, go build on, you know, Lava Zone 1. And right? So... So that's happening, and here, when you ask economists when the next recession might be, one third of respondents say not before 2021. Okay, that's hopeful. And of the remaining two thirds of respondents, half of the total, of roughly 50% of the total, are, have the, their expectation is centered on the early part of 2020, which is a year and a half from now. So I'm just saying, there's no like there's no timer on the expansion in 
principle it could extend out in the 2020s. This will probably be the longest economic expansion in history, not just U.S. history, but the history of the world. So, I mean, even Donald Trump can't screw that up. So we'll see where, well, he's trying, you know. But that's, you know, that's, the, the problem is, in terms of what we're talking about, the, up, the uptake, right, the absorption in a recession period is going to be relatively low. The builders aren't going to be able, and so that's the moment to double down and do the infrastructure. Put people back to work, and I hate to say it, start digging up Dillingham. Okay. We talked about affordability. Here are the actual home price distributions, and this is really important to understand. This is the di distribution of actual home prices last year on Oahu. Single family and condominium, all houses are houses. Okay, and here's the thing. This is where we all live. We all live over here. This guy needs slaps, and this guy needs a subsidy, but the rest of us all live over here. Yeah, plus or minus. Look, that's who's transacting. There's no restriction on people from transacting, and that's the outcome last year. What happened, and so half, right, the median, right, half the people live below, and then a bunch of guys over here, they live in a house that's worth more than one million dollars, right, so I don't care about them, and then the rest of us are over here, and by the way, stop making stupid rules, this is for the legislators in the room, no more rules with a threshold of one million dollars, right, this is not Dr. Evil making economic policy, if you need a threshold, make it a fixed proportion, a fixed quantile of the distribution. You know, the top 5%, the top 8%, right? The, right? Uh, roughly the top 8% of transactions last year. If, I mean, if you have to make a threshold, don't make it $1 million, like that stupid constitutional amendment, okay? Here's the problem. When you impose production quotas on builders, Right? You, you force them to build at the low end. They have to build at the high end to cross-subsidize the low end, which means they can't build in the middle. But we all live in the middle. So that's what Dean was talking about. He said, if you, have to, if you feel compelled to put an exaction on a builder, put it on the high end units. Don't make the middle guy, the, the guy building you know, don't make Stanford Carr build it. Let guys like Stanford Carr and Marshall Hung, these guys who build in the middle, just let them build, right? Go find a place where it makes sense for that stuff to be, right? The train station sh is a condo, right? The train station should be a condo and a retail gallery. You go stay in a hotel in Kowloon, you take the elevator, what's on the bottom, ground floor, the train station of the Hong Kong MTA. You know what I mean? You, the, the guy builds the train station because he gets to build the retail galleria and the condos that are the train station. I mean, it's so backwards here. Um, these distributions do change over time, which is why you can't have a fixed threshold like $1 million. And yes, in finite time, like in the next decade, half the homes on Oahu will trade at $1 million and up. That's just appreciation. That's why we buy the house. Because we get to live in it and because it appreciates. Okay? Just And your income goes up and the mortgage rate is... Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Here are the actual numbers and... Oh, I guess that's all I have for you. Okay, but this is the, this is the key point right there. This distribution is going to shift. But if you want units to be delivered in the middle, I, I had a whole other slide and it went something like this. You can adopt, there's a number of different rules you can adopt. One of them is like Dean's rule. Dean's rule is, the, Uchi, the Uchida rule is, the Baga building in the middle, build as much as the Baga like. Go build chok units, right? And trust me, they will find a place where people are willing to pay for that unit. If you provide through zoning and other entitlement mechanisms, the envelope in which to build. And if you need, you know, to visualize it, I'm thinking King Street, the Baratani Corridor, I'm thinking, you know, Lower Kalihi or whatever. I mean, 
we're at the point where people are moving back into town. And then, but you can do other rules. Like you could say, you could have like, you guys know the Taylor rule of monetary policy. You could have it a function of, right? You issue enough entitlement, or the, the amount of entitlement you allocate is a function of the rate of increase in home prices. If home price appreciation accelerates, then you dial up the entitlement allocation, right? I told you my eBay rule, put enough entitlement out till the value is zero. They may build, maybe they won't build, but at least it won't cost as much as going through and doing all this dance. You could have it as a function of the housing vacancy rate, right? You can have an inverse function, right? So if the housing vacancy rate is low, then you dial up the entitlement. You could have it, I, I just, you can make up a bunch of algorithms, is what I'm saying. You don't have to have this gatekeeping, come talk to Samurai Buddha head, he's gonna give you permit if you put the stakes in the, in the freezer in the guy's carport. You know what I mean? They, they don't do that anymore. But I'm told, in my youth, I was told that's how it works. You put the stake in the carport. Uh, yeah, you don't, right? We have mechanisms, we have algorithms that can replace the tedious, brain numbing, right? These poor public servants, they go to work, everybody's shitting on them, right? Because they can't get the work done because no one will give any money, nobody will hire any kids to take it, and they're gonna retire in two years. And they're gonna take all the knowledge of how the process works with them into retirement and become consultants like the rest of us. So keep them at their job and help them to develop an algorithmic response to the entitlement allocation problem. The end. Awesome.